Welcome back to the MBH podcast, Money Buys Happiness. First off, I want to say thank you to all our subscribers. Just passed a thousand. Give a little round of applause yeah. for that. Finally, thank appreciate you, you guys. Thank you. Keep liking, keep subscribing, comment which guests you want to see next. You guys know the deal. Woo! We got a heavy hitter today. Yep. You guys asked for it. We made it happen. Thank you to a few of the people in this room for making it happen. Roman Baber, welcome back to the show. Serge, welcome back. Thank you. Our third co-host. It's uh, Roman. The people have been asking for you to come back, man. They've been asking for it. Um, you seem to be the voice of reason, I'll say, um, you know, among, you know, the people that we know, uh, among our network. So, yeah, there, we're excited to have you back. I call you our neighborhood su superhero. Good to be with you, Anthony. <laughs> Good to be back. I mean, we, we were talking off mic a little bit about how we had you about a year ago. Um, and a lot has changed since then, but a lot hasn't changed as well. Um, so what have you been up to since we last spoke? Um, and then we're going to get into a bunch of stuff that, that's obviously been going on and, and a lot of questions that people have right now. Yeah. We're um, exactly a year since I've been kicked out of caucus. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you remember I, I was kicked a year ago uh, for speaking out against the lockdown because I felt that the toll of lockdown, the human toll of what the government was doing was actually potentially greater than the toll of the pandemic generally speaking yeah and here we are a year later and i'm making the same plea effectively yeah that we need to look at our mitigation measures and factor the toll the harm that they're causing people by way of health and mental health and here we are pleading again to lift the lockdown but something has changed materially in that the path that public health and government told us to take to exit the pandemic has not materialized. Yeah. And that has been the greatest bait and switch. And, and we have to speak frankly to, to all friends on all sides of the aisles and say, look, 90% of eligible Ontarians did what was asked of them. And in exchange for, you know, getting our lives back, going back to normal, doing the things we enjoy. No, here we are back in normal back in lockdown and that essentially suggests that everything that public health and government has been telling us over the last two years has been wrong yeah no i think and i think people are starting to finally see that and, and ask the same questions right i'm curious what has the feedback been um i guess we'll say from your audience you know from day one when you were kicked out compared to now Look, I, I, I try not to make this about myself. Mm. Uh, I think it's important that we stick to the facts. And I think that a lot of people, many more Canadians have started to agree with our view, or at least my view, by virtue of objective evidence. So a year ago, I, subject, I suggested that lockdown may be deadlier than COVID. We now have another year worth of evidence. So for instance, we know that the Canadian Medical Association came out about a month ago. They had a report done by Deloitte, which concluded that more than 4,000 Canadians already died as a result of delayed surgeries. Wow. Ontario canceled 300,000 surgeries and procedures over the last three waves of the pandemic. And so the human toll of that is going to be paid for years to come. Yeah. In my letter to the Premier a year ago, um, I was very worried about deaths from overdose and and to be honest with you like mental health and addiction is something that is very near and dear to me and in the weeks before my letter to the premier a year ago i was hearing of of a lot of overdose and public health came out with a report in may which suggested that the rate of increase in deaths from overdose from 2019 to 2020 was almost 80 percent almost doubled wow God. So if wow. you look statistically under age 50, the number, the increase in deaths from overdose alone in Ontario under age 50 is almost three times greater than all the deaths from COVID <laughs> under age 50. And this is overdose alone. Wow. And they're growing every day. They're growing yeah. every day. We have implemented a human catastrophe here. 
just to finish maybe one last point, we missed a million cancer screenings in 2020. Yeah. We have oncologists that are saying right now that they've never seen this type of um, wave of cancer and late diagnosis. I said to Dr. Sim, uh, Dr. Singh from McMaster's Children's Hospital, she said that many children died because their tumors weren't diagnosed early enough, that she could have saved a lot of children if their tumors were just diagnosed six months earlier. And that's, and that's the premise of this entire argument. Uh, Anthony, I never meant to, I never meant, of, of course we speak for small business and, and we speak for the atrocity that's called to everyone, but primarily my argument has always been about health and mental health. Yes. And the lockdowns are causing a greater catastrophe generally to our health and mental health than COVID generally speaking. COVID is a very serious infection, but two years later we have a lot of knowledge, we know who to protect, and we know which demographics are at risk. So locking down 15 million Ontarians and making them sick is not good pandemic policy. The best thing to do is to let us return to a semblance of normal. It's the best thing to do for our health. So I, I totally agree with you. And and I think the, the, the question a lot, a lot of people have is this, this information is readily available. Why are our leaders completely disregarding this information as if it's almost not even there? What's the, what's going even on? Even like public health, for example, they have access to this. They know it. Well, the politicians have a vested political interest, yeah. right? Yeah. Because then you're going to be questioning them. Well, what have you done for the last two years? <laughs> yeah. The Doug Ford government is touting the fact that we may have less COVID deaths in certain states in the United States. Of course, they've selectively picked the, the worst ones or they picked ones with very elderly populations like Florida, for instance. Yeah. But actually compare our performance to other provinces. We are 10th or 9th in terms of mortality from COVID, yet we had the longest lockdown in, the, in, in Canada. Yeah. We had the longest school closure in Canada at 26 weeks, maybe no, 27, 28 weeks, maybe longer than anywhere else in the world, right? We know that children are statistically at no, at no harm from the virus, and yet we've imposed such a catastrophe on them. So the politicians obviously don't want to admit mistake. Mm -hmm. And two years later, I talk about public health too. They're also politicians, yeah. right? And they're also ideologues. Like th these are the people that, you know, t tell you to have safe sex and quit smoking. Yeah. yeah. So like that's that's the ideology that that they're bringing to the table. They're also going to stand by their professional opinions. They're not going to embarrass themselves. I'm sorry, I'm a little wordy to, to finish up on your question, though. Yes, the numbers are readily available, but crystallizing this narrative of the disaster that's being perpetuated here, no one is willing to own it. Yeah. You, you actually mentioned in, in, our, in our previous conversation about a year ago, and I think you said the same thing. You said, this is purely political. And I think we see it more than ever today. Yeah. You know, bad decisions being made, information not being looked at and used to make new decisions. Um, and I guess, you know, we, we have the, um, the, 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 ele is the elections coming up, I think it's June, June, yeah. right? So I'm sure that plays a role to some extent in what's going on. But but, but I would imagine being, uh, you know, Doug Ford and his team, the, 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 the narrative or, or the, the conversations that are being had now, people seem to be able to get this information, right? Because you have guys like Sergio who are putting out, you know, um, sharing, inf sharing this information. So the people have it. So even to that extent, I wonder, I wonder like, is his team that um, oblivious to the fact that people have this information now? Instead, he's out there with a little shovel. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, even, even last time we spoke, you said um, he's just doubling down. And then he's tripling down. And he's quadrupling down. When does it stop? And, and will he have to pay for any consequences of, of maybe lying to his population? We can certainly hope yeah. for political accountability. Yeah. Um, look, uh, we heard the premier, Doug Ford, at Humber College on March 13th. He thought he was talking to his caucus or cabinet, but he was actually talking to the media. He for, I think he forgot. <laughs> and he said, and the quote is, uh, no politician in this country, in Canada, is going to disagree with public health. You might as well Hang tie Hang a, a noose around yeah. your neck and throw yourself off a bridge. Yeah. It's not gonna happen. Mm. And that told you everything you needed to know about the situation. 
yeah. is that he believes that not listening to the doctors is political suicide. To be clear, for anyone who's wondering, Doug is in control. The premier of a province can end this just like 35 or 40 governors have ended it south of the border. Yeah. The question is, does he have the political will and the courage to do the right thing? They made a decision very early in the pandemic that they will never deviate from public health advice because um, he will be accused of like killing grandma by the Toronto Star mm -hmm. by not <laughs> listening to the science. Crazy. And so that's the decision they decided to stick with. He's not going to turn around. Doug's not going to turn around two years later yeah. and say, I was kidding. <laughs> Enough with this. Yeah. Roman was right. Mm -hmm. Let's end this and, and go back to living. But the price of this, poli of, of this political direction is human life. Yes, exactly. That's the most upsetting thing here. We're, we're, not, we're not talking about something trivial. We're talking about human lives that are costing as a result of government policy. It's inexcusable. It's, it, it's so sad. Well, well I, I like that you said that. And I think that was even a question that I had and a lot of people have, have you know, ha had the same question. Does he really have the power to end this? Does Doug and his team really have the power to end this? And I guess you just answered that. He yeah. does. And, and beyond that, it's, it's a lot simpler than people think. You don't need to go to great lengths. You don't need to power up your imagination to a great extent to understand what's happening here. It's political. Yeah. And there's an element of cancel culture yeah. where people are unwilling to speak out against it because they pay the circumstances. Yeah. I pay the circumstances. I was kicked out of caucus. I was chair of parliament's justice committee. I lost that. An incredible privilege for a lawyer. Yeah. Um, we see people's careers being threatened. I just showed you a video. I played a video for you from the press conference this morning where the Minister of Health, Christine Elliott, is threatening doctors for, for expressing views that are somewhat out of the mainstream. And these are regulated professionals, mm -hmm. right? It's a self-regulating profession, physicians in Ontario. It, it takes, you, you gotta move a mountain to become a licensed physician in Ontario. Yeah. And after all of this, we threaten them like they do in, in some third world regimes. This is, and, and so that, that is in part what's happening here. You have some ideologues like Justin Trudeau who uses the type of divisive language that I would never thought was insane thinkable in in Canada. It's horrible. Yeah. And and for him, this is this is also an opportunity for greater intervention by the state. He's an interventionist. He's a radical left wing interventionist. He wants to control what's in this bottle of water, yeah. how it's packaged, mm -hmm. where it comes from, the labor that goes into it, the environmental quality and so on and so forth. And, and unfortunately, COVID has given rise to an incredible insertion of state into our lives. Yeah. yeah. But for people like Doug, and for most people, it's just political. This is where the wind is blowing. I've done what, what the wind is directing. Yeah. yeah. And now it's too hard for Doug to retreat because everything he's done for the last two years would seem to be wrong. And so, yes, he can end this, but he refuses to because that will probably cost him his premiership. But and won't it cost him his premiership anyways if he gets if they find out he was lying? So he's just betting on nobody finding out that he was able to make a choice here. No, he uh, uh, no, he wants to appear as okay. the leader that's making decisions. Okay. The question is it's not about finding out. It's the question of whether the narrative will change. Okay. Yes. Whether enough people will say, "You know what? Doug, uh you your government policy potentially killed more people than it saved." Yeah. And you knew that that was happening and because the data is there. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but, but the question is whether we're going to end this neuroses yeah. that, yes. that, that we have. And that is not to minimize the illness. COVID can, like I said, it can be very serious to some folks, but we need to be objective. And after two years, we've learned so much about this and we're still behaving as if it's, March or April worse. 2020, yeah. when we thought the world was coming to an it's end. It's not an yeah. emergency anymore. Yeah. We, yeah, so okay. I'm, you, you, you can't hope for political accountability. Yeah. But, but for that, you need an objective overview of what is happening here. 
And I don't think that the mainstream narrative has caught on yet. Yeah, and that's what I was yeah. going to say. Is is there opportunity, or maybe in the past has there been, um, you know, almost like a like like you said, an overview or an an overview of his time in office and decisions that he's made, or or that any premier, let's say, has made, and have the has that ever come down to, uh, you know, legal uh, legal. Um, I guess lawsuits being put in place and stuff like that. Has that ever happened? Can we expect that to maybe happen? Well, the accountability is really on election day. Yeah. Fair. That's okay. the day when people pass judgment on, on government policy. Official, yeah. The question is whether people are making a fair decision on the basis of the narrative that's, that's out there. Yeah. And unfortunately, the mainstream narrative has yet to retreat. Mm -hmm. Like one example I'm using, something happened last week that, that shocked me and, and was very personally upsetting for me. Christine Elliott admitted that for the last two years, the province has not been accurate about hospitalizations. In fact, it's been reporting hospitalizations with COVID as opposed to hospitalizations due to COVID because a lot of these hospitalizations are incidental. Yeah. Kid goes in, he fractured his leg. He needs to stay in a cast in a hospital for a week. They test him for COVID. At, wow. during admission, yeah. he tests positive, he's counted as COVID, COVID hospitalization. Wow. Yeah. Hospitalization is the single most important metric in this entire system because we respond, right? We're always told that we have to lock down, we have to flatten the curve to prevent our hospitals from being overwhelmed. Yeah. After two years, they sort of get caught because the narrative changes a little bit on that issue. And now they acknowledge that half, half of the people that are counted in Ontario's hospitals today as their COVID hospitalizations are actually there with COVID. Yeah. So they were artificially doubling the amount of people. So you would think that there would be a major outcry. Yeah. Of course. You would think that people will say, are you kidding me? You've been perpetrating this lie mm -hmm. on the people of Ontario, we paid such dire consequences for it. Meanwhile, the number was artificially almost doubled. Yeah. And no, no outcry. That. Yeah, no nothing. Thing. Very little. There even, a even like you said, you said it, and, and you mentioned it again, people have become numb to it, you know? So when they get this information, it's kind of just like, oh my God, like what else? Like sometimes for them, it's like, it's easier not to pay attention, right? Which is sad at this point. I don't know if it's numbness. I, I just... I was watching for the response from the media. Yeah. And Global had a, a short article on this issue. Okay. The Toronto Sun tweeted on this a couple of times. Okay. But you really didn't see the media come out and throw mm -hmm. the book at them yeah. and say, you ha it's government and public health that are the greatest purveyors of misinformation in this entire exercise. Yes. And yeah. so when, when you're asking me, are we going to have political accountability on election day? My answer is, if folks are able to make decisions that are based on objective reality and lying about the hospitalization numbers is is a damning objective reality then yes i'm just not sure that that is going to happen yeah. yeah well because the place that they're looking to for information isn't really doing their job properly and give and putting that information out right one -sided, one sided messaging um i want to talk about division a little bit because our prime minister came on television a couple weeks back um and I'm not going to say exactly what he said, but he's, he's trying to divide people, which has been a common theme throughout the pandemic. Um, what are your thoughts on the division? Why do you think that they're doing it? Um, and I know you guys have connected too, um, and you guys are building a community of support. So how has that helped with any sort of division that maybe you guys have seen? So at a time of crisis, leaders are supposed to unite people yeah. instead of pushing hate. And what... Justin Trudeau did is effectively, or what he's doing and what public health is doing, what so many politicians around the world are doing, yep. is they're demonizing an identifiable group of people, people that made a different medical choice than, than most. And that is, it's, it's not just un-Canadian, it's unprecedented. We have never done this before. We would never discriminate against someone or demonize someone because of their health characteristics. The entire argument makes no sense anymore because they've predicated this hate on the fact that 
folks that made the decision not to vaccinate are putting other people at risk. We know that that's categorically false. It's false. And we have to call it out for what it is. The chief medical officer acknowledged a number of times now that Omicron is spreading among fully vaccinated individuals. Okay. We're seeing a study supported by public health um, that suggests that we're, we're not seeing that two shots prevent the actual spread of Omicron. And so, and the booster has a limited effect. And so that immediately takes the argument that an unvaccinated person puts a vaccinated person at risk immediately off the table. Yeah. Okay. They can still try and make the argument about efficacy of the vaccine at preventing bad outcomes. That's a different argument. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, you know, sitting next to someone on a plane or a train and putting them at risk, that is misinformation. Yeah. And it's on the, st on the, foundation of that misinformation that this division and, and hate have blossomed and the fact that ordinary Canadians, so many ordinary Canadians are now experiencing the sentiment. And in fact, the prime minister is back in office yeah. is something for us to be very, very concerned about. And which is why we need to speak to all sides. We have so much division now between vaccinated and unvaccinated people. And, and to some extent, it, it comes from the unvaccinated side as well. Yeah. Sometimes my own supporters criticize me for making a different decision than they had made. We need to put this away Agreed. as quickly as we can. Um, we owe it to this wonderful experiment that we used to have here called Canada where we would be accepted and loved irrespective of our individual characteristics and have every opportunity. And instead, we're now pitting people against one another. It's unacceptable and it's a tactic that the prime minister often uses. Shame on him. What, 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 what do you think is the goal? What, 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 it's what, intentional, obviously. He's, yeah, being, he's well, being intentional. It's, yeah, it's extremely intentional. And what, uh, Roman, what, what do you think, what is your opinion on why he's doing this what what is he getting out of this and like you said it, it's it's extremely un-canadian the radical left has always used division as a tool tactic us versus them mm. whether it's economic classes whether it's um racial tensions we had much better discourse in terms of civil rights um before the, the latest attempt to divide us, right? Justin Trudeau wore blackface at least three times. How dare he go out and, and call other people racists? I, I know everyone here, and I don't think that anyone, irrespective of their background coming to Canada, has any racist bone in their body. Agreed. And to suggest that someone could be racist because they made a different medical choice. It's ridiculous. It's, um, I, I, I don't know, guys, you, yeah. you, yeah. you know me, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I have difficulty hiding the way I feel. Of yeah. course. And we need, and, and, and the real enemy here, he, here, the, the real point of contention is cancel culture. Hmm. It's the fact that a lot of folks would not be able to articulate, would not have the confidence to say what I just said, because they would be worried about their jobs or they'd mm -hmm. be worried about their businesses. Yeah. And that's what we need to encourage and hopefully encourage among your listeners. Yeah. We, a lot of us are immigrants in this country, including myself. We came to this country because we sought freedom of speech yeah. and we should not be afraid of saying it how it is. And no one should threaten us to preclude us from saying it how it is. I agree, especially not in a country like this. Uh, you, you actually, you made a video um, talking about your background and how you came from um, communism. I want to touch on that a little bit. Um, that's actually something that myself and Ernesto have been preaching since the beginning of this, that we felt a lot of the measures that were being put in place, the way that our leaders were speaking, um, that we were sort of headed down a road, a slippery slope into something whether it be communism, similar to communism. What is your thoughts on that? You made that video. I'm curious to know. I, um, 
I spoke, I made a member statement in parliament yes. about the fact that I'm seeing certain behavior from government that is reminiscent of the regime that my family escaped when I was nine, and that was the communist Soviet Union. And ironically, most of the statement wasn't even about COVID. It was about the fact that, for instance, the Doug Ford government passed a law that shields itself from legal liability when, when it's harder to hold the government accountable in court. Shielding yourself from liability is undemocratic. Agreed. They passed a law early on forcing gas stations to put a sticker on about the carbon tax. I, I'm not a fan of the carbon tax, but I'm also not a fan of government forcing a private business to post a political message at their place of business. That is something that you'd expect from communist regimes. Yeah. Early on, there was a lot of nepotism. Chief of staff to the premier, Dean French, he appointed, I think it was his wife's niece, I, I, f I forget, but like a, a, a relative, relative of his wife to a, a trade position, and he appointed his son's uh, teammate, lacrosse teammate, to be <laughs> trade representative to Come like on. Texas. I, and I, I apologize if I forget the exact facts, but, yeah. but this, is, this is very real. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so that is another thing that the communists often do. Yeah. Is that they appoint their loved ones and families to positions of, of power and, and privilege. Um, whereas really we expect meritocracy. But on the COVID question, and, and that's a question that I get asked often, like, Roman, is there any similarity between this two, like the Soviet Union? And I say, look, well, well first of all, the, the lineups to the liquor store, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I, I drive by my local LCBO sometimes and I see the lineup and yeah. like crazy, uh, crazy, wow. yeah. it's just yeah. unreal. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and w the funny thing is, it's because of capacity limits, people have to stand outside. Yeah in the cold mm -hmm. or in the rain or in the elements or in like minus 11, which is the weather right now. And like, they're getting sick yeah. by virtue of the fact that they're cold, right? This is just absurdity. Well, it's but just like the outdoor patios too. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We have the TTC forcing the opening of windows on buses and streetcars, you know, to, to, let fresh to, to let in fresh air. So there's better air circulation. Oh, oh you're wearing a mask. Gosh. And it's, cold yes. <laughs> so so that's so the lineups the liquor store but yeah but more importantly the the biggest i would say comparison for me is the fact that what often happens in those type of regimes communist regimes and generally dictatorial regimes is that public policy is often driven on false information it's predicated on a false narrative and that is what has happened for the last two years is that we have this false narrative that we have to lock down healthy people yeah. to prevent the spread. We have this false narrative that government is able to control a very transmissible virus. We have a false narrative that young people or potentially children are at great risk of COVID. Yes, there are exceptions, but statistically speaking, uh, thankfully, yeah. Children are at almost no risk to COVID. And so that's the greatest similarity is that government is engaging in remarkable acts, extraordinary acts on the basis of a false narrative. That's the similarity with, with communist regimes. I heard Sergio's clip a couple of weeks ago on the show where he says that not only we have become numb, but we're also... Becoming numb means we've accepted this mm -hmm. abnormal reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. On my way here, I, I walked through Queen Street and I, I got such joy out of just walking Queen West. Um, I love the city of Toronto very much. And um, I was so saddened to see so many vacancies. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe what we've been made to accept. Yeah. And it's based on a bad narrative that could have been prevented 100 percent. well it's like you said we're, we're we're two years into this we know the data we know what's going on it's it's there it's available so to be making the same decisions over and over you know month after month week after week it gets tiring but it's very sad it's very sad that our our society and and 
you know, it's hard to blame the people because we're generally good people in Canada. We listen to authority, you know, to, to a certain extent because we put that trust. We put that trust in these elected officials. But I think another issue here, and I'm curious your thoughts on it, is a lot of these these health officials are unelected. So, you know, I'm curious as to how unelected officials have been given so much power pretty much complete power if you if you're looking at it from the media the mainstream media's perspective you know we 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 have these these health ministers sitting standing in front of the cameras you know making very some very scary claims you're unelected we didn't choose for this person to be there yet they're up there with so much power that some people's livelihoods some people's lives have been have been you know used and, and and paid for in this pandemic so i'm curious what your thoughts are on these unelected officials health officials how they got so much power um and how we've gotten to a place where we're looking we're looking at them as our leaders so to be very clear they are only as powerful as the elected officials allow them to be mm, okay so doug doug's authority supersedes that of the doctor okay at the end of the day, it's the political class. It's the premier cabinet that make decisions. Yeah. So it's a question of the extent to which the elected officials have ceded voluntarily power to the medical doctors. Now, what, what has happened um, is the beginning of this exercise has been so regretful that certain principles stuck, and that is the politically correct notion that we have to do everything possible to keep each other safe. That collectivist notion predicated on something that is impossible. It's a very transmissible virus. Yes. You have to limit all contact to like prevent spread. But if you have essential services, if you go into grocery stores, if you have m trucks moving between borders, unless you shut down life, this highly transmissible respiratory virus is going to transmit. We'll never have zero COVID. We, They've well, said that we too. can't they have that we'll never admitted have that. for sure but when in the beginning of this people have suggested that we need to potentially get to zero covid as if that's possible but also we have significantly overestimated the actual general risk of the virus to the general population yeah. and the reason for that is we didn't understand how prevalent covid is in the community i think i mentioned to you in your previous podcast for me, COVID was over, or the, the great fear was over around May 2020, because a bunch of studies came out that said that for every person that we're testing with COVID, there's between 10 to 20, 10 to 30 or 40 people out there walking with COVID. Yeah. And that's actually very good news, because that means that all the metrics we were worried about, like percent of hospitalizations, percent of deaths, is actually a lot lower. Yeah, than expected, yeah. But in the first couple of months, we didn't know that. And so we had this mania, and that mania gave purpose to public health doctors yeah. and media and governments tried to do everything possible to prop these doctors up mm -hmm. in order for their authority not to be questioned because we had to save lives yes that's how it happened mm -hmm. that's how the doctors gain all this power the fear of the virus for the first couple of months in the unknown the politically correct proposition that we have obligations to save lives which is not a bad idea if you're act, acting sensibly. Yeah. And now you can, it got to the point where you can speak against authority because of that cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I'll, I'll end this point with the way I started it. The political class, Doug Ford can end this today if he wants to, irrespective of what the doctors think. Mm -hmm. He won't because that means that everything he's done, at least for the last year or so, has been wrong yeah touching on uh on cancel culture and censorship we've seen a lot of it lately um you guys both experience censorship as well with with your own platforms uh what do you what do you think the goal of the censorship is because in my eyes it's just that they're just trying to hide something right i mean that's what i'm thinking when they're trying to censor people especially health health officials that think the opposite of the narrative right so what do you think the plan is with the the censorship can we expect more of it and what is the goal behind it? I am perplexed by this. Um, and frankly, I don't have a good answer for you. 
Ernesto, I, I don't know. Yeah. We, part of it stems from what I just described, mm -hmm. yeah. is that they genuinely felt that it's up to them to help public health, to help public health save lives. Yeah. Yeah. And because of that, uh, they need to be censoring any, any dissent. Mm -hmm. But the danger there is what's called groupthink, where we no longer have honest professionals around the table that are asking sensible questions like, does this make sense? Yeah. Are you not potentially killing more people than you're saving? Are you able to stop a highly transmissible virus? And what ends up happening is inevitably, they turn out to be wrong. Yeah. And I actually want to take a moment on this. For th This is a very important distinction that I think that a lot of folks don't, don't understand. For about two years, they've been telling us that the virus is a droplet transmission virus. In other words, we communicate, there's a little bit of fluid coming out and catch that fluid and yeah. boom, you got COVID. Yeah. But now, two years later, finally, public health acknowledge that it's an airborne virus. It transmits through aerosol, through the air. And that is a fundamental distinction because that immediately renders so much of what we've done for the last two years completely senseless. So for instance, they're now acknowledging that cloth masks don't make much difference because they don't prevent airborne transmission. Yeah. They're not saying you got to go to the N95 respiratory mask. Yeah. Okay, well, but folks have been questioning this f for years, whether it made sense, right? If but unfortunately, you weren't even allowed to ask that to the point where we we now know that cloth masks don't make a difference and you still have to wear a cloth mask yes. in, in public spaces. <laughs> this if, is you, just, if you spoke up before, they would call you an anti-masker. Yep, sure. Yep. So plexiglass, you know, the crazy glass. I, oh I know you guys work with a lot of businesses. Yeah. yeah. And, and now the head of the science table is saying that plexiglass actually does more harm than good wow. because it prevents airflow mm -hmm. <laughs> wow because the new name of the game is airflow and all these businesses spent so right. much money on on all these yeah, glass that's right. thanks to the government you had you had them saying that it's all about mobility that we want to restrict mobility because that will restrict transmission but every time we hit may or so yeah. when the weather gets better <laughs> even though you know cases go away mobility increases but cases are down yeah they have been wrong on everything. Yes. They told us the vaccines will get us out of the pandemic. Like I said, I'm pro Here voluntary we vaccination. We're back in lockdown. Yeah. So we need to stop. We need to remember that public health are also people. Yeah. And they can be wrong. And they're doctors. And many of them are not good doctors. Many of them have not seen a live patient. Yes. In mm -hmm. decades. And we need to stop worshiping public health. Yeah. And start putting them to the task, asking them serious questions. Can you imagine if, if you ran a, an organization where people have consistently been wrong and they have led to disastrous consequences, would we not want accountability from them? 100%, but that's not how it works with public health, unfortunately, because government and politicians are unwilling to hold them accountable because that will make themselves accountable. Yes. Because they put them in power. Because they have refused to exercise any objective judgment yeah. and question the insane course that public health has took us on for the last two years. Well, yeah, I guess it's kind of been everybody just sort of taking a step back and not wanting that judgment or not wanting that accountability, right? Oh, well, we'll just give it to the, this this mm -hmm. health minister or that doctor, put this person in the spotlight, that person in the spotlight. And it's funny you say that because I've noticed Doug, Doug hasn't been on TV a lot recently. He hasn't been speaking Is a lot. Shoveling? I mean, other than his little <laughs> shovel, whatever. But and his distracted driving, which yeah. they, which they literally can, they they raised that fine. They ripped and, him and, apart. And yeah, he got ripped apart for it. But I've noticed he hasn't been on TV. And and a lot of other people that we're used to seeing on TV also have stopped making these normal appearances, right? Are you are you think they're scared? What do you think they're they're scared? It's a political tactic. Yeah. When when you have lockdown, when you have objectively bad news, yeah. you don't want Doug's appearance. Yeah, you know? okay, fair. Right? So they're hiding him. Mm -hmm. He's been hiding at the cottage yeah. uh, throughout the winter break. <laughs> so crazy. Up. And 
meanwhile, folks are genuinely suffering and really needlessly. Yeah. Omicron is so transmissible. And it's, it's like the chief medical officer said, it's transmitting among the fully vaccinated. Our hospitals are traditionally where they are during this time of year, yeah. which is it, the, the, we're not fighting Omicron right now. We're actually fighting our deficit in healthcare. Canada has the lowest number of beds per population yeah. in the entire OECD, all the developed countries. We have the lowest number of beds. Wow. And yeah. it's been like that for it's been like that, yeah. a long time. Yeah. We now have less healthcare workers than we did in the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. Government is actually forcing them out. Yeah. Either it's because workers are unvaccinated, thousands of workers were let go by hospital administrators because they're unvaccinated, even though we know that transmission is now essentially the same among the vaccinated population. We have these COVID protocols, isolation protocols, where if someone's exposed to like a family member or close contact, they have to sit in isolation for seven to 10 days. Yeah. So if hospital staff, healthy hospital staff, that by public health dicta has to sit at home, yeah, right? You, you have um, Bill 124, the Doug Ford government legislated a cap on an increase. I was a member of the government at the time. You can only increase nurses' pay by 1% a year. With inflation wow. 5% a year, they're wow. actually taking a pay cut yeah. as they continue to work. In a pandemic year, red. a nurse that's making 80000 a year gets like a $50 a month raise. Yeah. So they're exiting because of low morale and, and low pay. So, so much of this is actually caused by government. And I hope that folks at home understand what kind of real profound effect government has on our lives. Yeah. It's very, very negative. Yes. And a lot of, a lot of your viewers, right? We're talking about young people there. We, we see how government is effectively ruining our lives. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a shift with the young viewership and towards to what you have to say? Absolutely. So the majority of, of our supporter growth is, is in the younger age categories. And I think it's not just, it's not just a natural occurrence because young people are less afraid of COVID, but also because what's been happening for the last two years has been fundamentally taking apart what our country is. And the biggest element, and I talk about this a lot, that, that made me love Canada so much is Canadian opportunity. Yeah. I always felt that, you, you know, I tell this story often. I, we, we came to this country. We're very, very poor. And, and, uh, I, I really know what, what extreme poverty is, uh, for a family of four. And, um, but I've always had this joy and, and this, and a job. Mm. And I've always had this joy because I always had opportunity. Because all you need to do to succeed in Canada is work hard and be nice to people. Yeah. And if you just do those two things, everything will be okay. Yeah. And now but, we can't even work. But now, and so that's precisely my point. Now, with what has happened in the last two years, young people feel as if they're losing on that Canadian opportunity. Yeah. Yes. They're losing hope that they'll be able to make a, a good living. They're losing hope that they'll be able to afford their dream home. They're losing hope that they'll even be allowed to engage in normal life. Yeah. And, and that is why I think we're seeing a shift, a, a shift in, in the younger population. And we need to fight yeah. for our willingness, uh, sorry, for our ability to make a living, to raise a family, to access healthcare, to be ourselves. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna bring up the Charter of Rights. Because a lot of people have been coming to me and him especially and just saying, like, isn't this a violation of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Um, is it? And how can we kind of fight back? Because that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so you enforce the Charter through the courts. Okay. The Charter of Rights, part of Canada's Constitution, guarantees certain rights. Okay. Rights to mobility, rights to f expression, free speech, etc. Okay. But... It explicitly states in section one 
that the rights are only guaranteed to a reasonable extent. Okay. okay. And they're guaranteed to the extent that can be demonstrably, the language is demonstrably justified, to a reasonable extent that can be justified. Because we know that rights are not absolute. So for instance, we know that we have the right to liberty under Section 7, but we put people in jail. Yeah. So because we believe that under certain circumstances, you can ab abridge those rights. Yeah. Yes. Unfortunately, when, when it comes to, to the COVID framework, essentially every charter decision rendered by the courts in the last couple of years has gone in the direction of the government mm. because courts believe that the abridgment of our rights, the limitation of our rights when it comes to COVID, at least to the extent that they have to date, have been justifiable. Mm, okay, so from, from the court of law, they're saying that they're, it's justifiable what they've been... We had a lot of decisions yeah. uh, on this um, from, from trying to um, open places of worship during yeah. lockdown on the basis of freedom of religion to opening your retail store. There was an appliance store. To gyms. Uh, to th there's been many decisions. Sometimes with gyms, you have some exceptions. Um, but generally speaking, most litigation has failed. Courts are not operating in a vacuum. They're operating within their cultural and and in within their cultural environment. Yeah. Contrast that to the United States, where a couple of days ago the Supreme Court of the United States struck down Biden's um, mandate mandate for for workplaces of over a hundred people. You're seeing a very different cultural approach by yes. the courts. That actually speaks to the difference between our two countries. Um, in the United States, you have a lot more of what used to be a democratic spirit, which is to question government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It's OK to question one's own government. It's OK to demand better. It's, it's OK to not necessarily uh, be on board and, and, and to just generally suspect that government can can have bad motives such as politics yeah canada is not like that a lot of canadians could never believe that you know that politicians could ever lie to them mm -hmm. which is unfortunately naive and mm -hmm. that's because we're generally like you know we're we're well-meaning <laughs> yeah. people yeah, we're exactly. kind yeah that's that's how in part we got here yes, is, is because we're nice and kind and and well-meaning mm -hmm. i Hopefully we can find a balance between those yeah. two. Yeah. No, no you, I was actually just about to ask you why things seem to be going in a brighter direction in, in the States um, and why not here? And why aren't we looking, you know, to them uh, for, let's say, inspiration when it comes to certain uh, decisions from government? But I guess you kind of answered that. Or just that. a balance. Like they have more of a balance. Yeah, it looks like. but I mean, it's like, you know, we, we, if we look at the conservatives here mm. compared to the conservatives there. Yeah. And this is a, obviously a blanket statement. We're generalizing. Um, they seem to be much more pro-freedom um, compared to ours, where I think we have, like you, like you were saying, sort of just laid down uh, to the government. And, and we don't really, I don't know if it's that we don't care to question them. Do we have too much trust? Um, but exactly, like we, we look across the border to the south and, and you know what I mean? Like the, generally a lot, of, um, a lot of states are opening up to whatever extent, right? Um, and here we are still in, you know, lockdown 4.0 or 5.0, whatever the case is. We still is, have so. an empty stadium now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even, even the UK is going to stop all mandates. Um, I'm sure you heard about that. How do you think that they came up with that decision so quickly? And do you think that we can follow those footsteps? Do you is think it cultural? <laughs> Boris Johnson got caught <laughs> yeah, at, the Prime Minister at yeah. a bunch of parties bunch over of parties. the holidays. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and he was under immense political pressure. So all we need yeah. to do is yes. we need to prove Catch someone at a party. that Doug is <laughs> violating public health orders. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, he has violated he, he is. has violated tons. Over a ton. Yeah. yeah. He got so, you, he, yeah. so you remember, you know, he went to the cottage yeah. where no one's supposed to go to the cottage. Yeah. You remember he made cheesecake. Yeah. <laughs> he made cheesecake at his mom's house when nobody was able to see each other. Yeah. Yeah. Cheesecake video. He was yeah. he was going there. And, and at the same time, his nephew also visited Michael Ford, I think. Mm -hmm. um, he um, had his daughters over for, I think it was Mother's Day, yeah. 
when public health told everyone not to celebrate Mother's Day. Don't see your family. Yeah. Right. So the other the other day, that gimmick that that he had with <laughs> shoveling snow. Oh yeah. my God. Right. His communications director is in the is in the photos is in the footage right next to it. staged. Him. Oh my God. So, I didn't know that. Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, wow. Alana Yelich is right there in the picture. So he's driving like healthy 20 to 30 year olds home without a mask. Yeah. yeah. FaceTiming. Right? FaceTiming. FaceTiming <laughs> takes pictures of that. This is, this is another form of, yeah. actually that is also reminiscent of to communism. To show that you're helping. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. Is that, is that the, you know, the, the elite political class are subject to different rules. Yes. Yeah. So, if we, <laughs> I, I think uh, in large part, Boris Johnson announced the end of measures and even masks uh, because he got caught doing yeah. something that he, he shouldn't have. Caught. Yes. Wow. That's how quick it can come down, eh? I'm curious. I'm curious your thoughts. This is a little bit away from uh, COVID and those mandates, but um, just a, a little bit more on our economy. Inflation's at an all time high. Um, and. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on that. Do you think there's a way out of that? Uh, clearly, our the um, the federal government has has it, it, it seems like they have no plan. Um, I'm sure you've seen Pierre Pierre Pouvoir in um, in the House repeatedly asking you know for numbers um, and repeatedly you know given absolutely no answers. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on our situation with inflation. Yeah. Um, and then also what your thoughts are on the way that uh, Pierre handles himself in the house uh, and, and, and gets absolutely no responses. Like how can they it, just not respond? Well, I also get no responses. The joke is yes. they, yeah. call it, they call it question period, not answer period, <laughs> which is fine. But I think the first prescription to dealing with inflation, like with so many other things in life, is to tell the truth. Yeah. And that actually is something that I'm going to call Pierre Polyev out on, because only recently did the federal conservatives start talking about lockdowns and, and this insane public health situation that we're in and passports and mandates. And for all of Pierre's questioning of the inflation, he never actually stated the main reason for the current inflation which we're experiencing which is lockdown yeah, that's, that's true, true. That's yeah. true. it's our response Fair. to COVID and the lockdowns that is causing this hyperinflation so a couple yeah. of things are happening first of all the global supply chain is behind Correct. so you have less supply of product that causes an increase in prices the second one is demand yeah when you reopen the market all of a sudden you have unison you have a lot of demand at the same time for the same product and of course, demand jacks up the price as well. Yeah. You also had this COVID response by the federal government where it effectively almost doubled our federal debt. Yeah. We doubled how much we owe. We owed about 630 billion. I think 650 pre-pandemic. We're now at about 1.3 trillion. Wow. I apologize if I'm yeah. off by a number or two, but I'm generally right, I think. And why the federal government had to print a ton of money, create a ton of money to help with COVID response yeah. Yeah. because of lockdowns. So the first, the first thing we need to do, and, and that will help a lot of our public policy generally, is just tell the truth. Yeah. And, and I encourage Pierre Polyev to um, call out lockdown for what it is as being the main driver of inflation. I think generally speaking um we're in a very tough situation but i'm hopeful that once we sort of return to normal hopefully sooner <laughs> than later and yeah. hopefully permanently yeah. and yeah. hopefully permanently that the market will stabilize and that will mean the monetary market as well mm -hmm. in terms of economy as well i want to bring up the truckers and what's happening with them um what are your views on what's happening with them? Um, I've, I, what I know is that they're not being allowed in the country unless they have a vaccine, mm -hmm. right? That's what, that's what they started with. Okay. Um, but then it seems that they've, they've been protesting. In Ottawa, right? And, and they have switched it, to my understanding. And then they switched it back. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, okay. So, I didn't yeah, know that. No, it's okay. back. No. Okay. So you can't enter, if you're unvaccinated, you can't enter um, Canada from the United States yeah. as a U.S. trucker if you're unvaccinated. And if you're a Canadian and you're unvaccinated, 
then when you return to Canada, you have to, you're subject to like greater quarantine rules. Yeah. And so that's what's really happening. And, and that makes their business unviable. This is another example of, of us shooting ourselves in, in the foot. We just, we just can't help ourselves. And this is a perfect example of ideology um, prevailing over common sense. Yeah. Unfortunately, this obsession with, with vaccination has reached proportions where we're not just hearing hateful, hateful rhetoric that previously was unthinkable in Canada, but it has very real implications on our everyday lives. Yeah. Um, you're subject to greater isolation requirements if a person's unvaccinated. We have an incredible labor shortage out there. We have a deficit in all services. I think 40 public, uh, 40 public libraries are closed in the city of Toronto today. So and sad. it's it's important for a lot of people. Like the library is a place for people to go to yeah. to have some peace, to, to be away. warm. <sighs> and and I hear from so many business owners, and maybe we can we can talk about that also for a moment. That are really struggling with the isolation protocols. Yeah, and the truckers is a prime example of the extreme insanity of this ideology. And it's going to lead to, uh, we know that it's likely going to lead to shortages and, and empty shelves, which is going to create a panic of its own. And then it perpetuates itself. Yes. It's like a run on the bank. You might have a run on the store. I'm, so, and, and what's worse than all of this is that we were told that vaccination is going to get us out of the pandemic. 90% of un eligible Ontarians are now vaccinated. And here we are back in lockdown. It's worse. It's worse. So, uh, wow. I mean, it totally makes sense. I, I just I just want to go back one second to you getting absolutely no responses, the same as Pierre in the house. How is that possible? As, as somebody watching these uh, these clips of you going at it, Pierre going at it, guys like you going at it, receiving absolutely no real responses how how is that possible as, as as a canadian taxpayer <laughs> i'm trying to understand how they can stand across from you um and just completely disregard the questions that are being asked or lie yeah or, it, there you go like how how is that possible how is that not governed <laughs> to whatever extent so so you can't legislate truth because <laughs> fair because, be because a lot different positions. because public health would legislate it truth that we might not want yeah yeah, yeah, that's yeah true, right? exactly that's, so you have to but in terms of parliament what what you see happening there is the idea behind question period is political accountability i ask a question how many nurses how many net new nurses have you hired since the beginning of the pandemic they don't answer the question we know that in fact it's now less nurses than we had before yeah they can't say that because it will embarrass them so when they don't give you an answer or they evade your question or they're being untruthful in their answer, you also did your job because you have exposed true. Yes. the government for its malfeasance or for its incompetence or whatever it is. And then you hope that polit political accountability will do the trick. Yeah. So Christine Elliott was not truthful about an answer. The public will hold the Doug Ford government politically accountable on election day. Mm. You can only hope for that. Yes. The public is not even holding them, her accountable for artificially dubbing, doubling hospitalizations over the last two years. Yes. Lying sure. to us about the most important metric on the basis of which we engage in these lockdowns where we're counting people with COVID rather than from COVID. Yeah. yeah. So if we don't hold government politically accountable on the most basic lies that drive this entire pandemic policy, how do we have any hope in doing that in parliament? That's the other thing that happened. To, to our country when I'm saying so much so much has changed is that our basic institutions like parliament that are supposed to protect our democracy are now losing some of their ability to defend our democracy. Yeah, no, I, I, that's, and, and think that is something, and I appreciate you going and doing what you're doing because as, as a Canadian, I, I watch that and yeah, exactly, it continues to expose the lies, the, the misinformation from their end or, or the, the, the action to not 
give out that proper information or answer the questions that are being asked. So I appreciate you doing that. It, it you know, I think it's uh, those little clips you guys have been clipping, man. Keep clipping them because people 100%. need to see it. People need to see it yeah. more. Um, I you know th- this question is maybe personal and for people my age. I'm I'm 25, business owner here. What what can we do? What what can the people do um, to you know to request real real answers to request real information? Uh, of course, come election day, make make a good decision for sure. But outside of that, leading up to it, what can we do? What can we do as as young Canadians, business owners, um, to, to fight for for our rights here and the right to real information? We have to get politically engaged. Yeah which is why I encourage your viewers to join me at joinroman.ca. There's strength in numbers. Our ability to influence the spread of information. What Sergio does is terrific. It really makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Yes. In speaking to a large audience where you share sensible, objective, truthful information that otherwise people might not get from mainstream sources yep. to change opinion. We're not only talking among ourselves, where generally we agree with one another. We need to be talking to folks that don't agree with us. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to present them <clears throat> with a sensible, compelling argument that's predicated on reality. Mm-hmm. Our hospital capacity is just is roughly what it was in the last five years. We transmit COVID transmits among the fully vaccinated. Um Lockdowns are objectively killing people. Public health has been objectively wrong on A, B, C, D. Yeah. And let's be a little bit more hopeful in terms of our COVID response. This is no longer March or April 2020. Yeah. So information, political organization. If government knew that it was going to be fired, then it would change course. If Agreed. Doug Ford knew that on June 2nd, there's going to be a million kids that previously haven't voted. And when I say kids, I mean like people 18 to 30. Yeah. Um, He'll change course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He'll change, right? <laughs> of course. So, yeah. Look up Boris Johnson. <laughs> and, and that Same has thing. not happened. Yeah. yeah. So we need to organize. And, and people say, well, Roman, I mean, who do we vote for? Are you going to vote liberal or NDP? I don't like either of them. There's no one to vote for today. Yeah. But you cannot reward the Doug Ford government. Agreed. For what they've done to us for the last two years. Agreed. And if the other, if, if anyone else comes to power, they should be made aware that we will not tolerate this and we will fire them too. Can't make the same mistakes. No. Yeah. So that's, and, and, but of course, they're driven mm-hmm. by public opinion. Yes. And so the best thing we can do is to make our opinion heard. Yep. And that means speak out and do not be afraid. And that means expression, not just in person to your family, to your friends, but in social media as well. Write a letter to the editor. Talk to a friend that is, is not convinced that COVID is not going to kill them. Yeah. Um, it's persuasion and fair information and political organization. I think it's very important to get involved with the community yeah. and yeah. speak out and get these conversations going. You know, we got to thank someone like Roman Baber pretty much got fired for, for speaking out against yeah. the lockdown. And we all need to speak out. And going yeah. back to censorship or cancel culture, you really can't give a fuck. I mean, you're going strong, sir. You can't, stronger you than can't ever. give a fuck. You know, if they put us in another lockdown, you're going to get fired anyways. You're going to get let go. Yeah. yeah. So now is the time to speak out. Become your own media. Yes. You know, because we can't count on the mainstream media. Nope. So it's up to us to speak out and share those facts and get the conversations going. Yeah. You know? No, I like, I, I like that you guys are preaching that. To speak You've been out. very boots on the ground, you know, community-based. And I think that's that's huge. A lot of... And politicians that's something as we that see are not doing that's any something either. Ford doesn't you do. You just see Ford taking out a shovel once yeah. a year and, and it was a photo walk. Yeah, yeah, that's Same all it was. Same with Tory. Um, to- to- Tory's become the Pfizer spokesperson. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know? That's all he says though. That's, that's all, all he, he talks, talks about. about. Um how did you guys 
uh, connect. And I noticed that it's, it's community has been big for you. I mean, you're connecting with a lot of people in community and, and trying to build your message from the ground up. Um, so why is it important that you connect with people like Sergio, like Ella, that are being also a voice for the people? Actually, this is a story that I think about often and, and that I, I like to tell um, about Sergio, who's become a very good friend. Uh, <clears throat> Sergio and I connected through a mutual um, friend who's also uh, helped me a little bit politically. And um, he came to my constituency office, and this was, I think, during the second wave. Yep. Um, shortly after I was kicked out of caucus, maybe a month later. And this was during the time where there was partial opening. And uh, um, as, as we know, Sergio uh, sells high-end uh, clothing as well and Best on top of everything else that, <laughs> yeah. that he does. And um, that was the week when retail was allowed to open up by 25 to 50%. And Sergio said to me that it doesn't matter that one of his businesses is able to open up until all everyone else is open he said until all of my friends the entire community until everybody is allowed to go back to work and to their livelihood i'm i want to help wow um and that has stayed with me because i i see the pandemic through the eyes of many people and i get a lot of difficult messages and i speak to a lot of people and a lot of young people um, I, I, I get calls from all Ontario and, and so I see the pandemic through the eyes of the people that talk to me yeah. and that's how I, how I felt about surgery as well when he told me that he's not going to rest until everyone is open and I say that as well we all need to come back yeah. Yeah. everyone and, yeah. and the Zoom class you know, including myself like we have not been disadvantaged by the pandemic economically as, as much as other people yeah but that is irresponsible and unacceptable. And I speak to so many small business owners that yeah. are struggling so much today. Doug jokes around doing photo ops on shoveling snow. Meanwhile, people are to their last savings. People have mortgaged their homes. Yeah. People are losing decades of work. Yeah. They're mentally exhausted. And, and all of this is predicated on, on bad narrative and we're literally harming, causing such harm to people. So um, we need to vow that we will not end this, we will not end our advocacy effort and I will not end it. And I'm sure Sergio won't end either until everyone has an opportunity to be back. Yep. We need to be living. Yeah, we again. got your back too on that. We're all we're all essential. Yep, we are. I don't, and I don't believe the government should be able to decide who is and who isn't. Yeah. Um, listen, before we get to our famous question <laughs> on this podcast, we we, we had some questions. I, I know you're probably running out of time. We had some questions from some 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 of our viewers, but my favorite one is: Can we expect you to run for premier of Ontario? Um, you need to run with the party. Okay. You got In order right to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we got you a party. Come on. Got, okay. I can't wait to party. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to say, we got to, we, we got to turn this podcast around a little bit. Yeah, I, yeah. I am, um, like, I, I, I had a thought a couple of months ago on, yeah. on how the pandemic would look like, what the end would be like. Me being back at the Raptors with my, yes. with my drink coming yeah, down to my seats. Beer. Full state. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and and full stadium, no distancing, no masks, and the the home team takes the floor, and yes. it's it's not the same now. And and I I've know. been to to a couple of games before wow. they were shut down again. No, there's no joy yeah. knowing that 20 percent of Canadians can't come in. But like people ask me, Roman, what are you going to do after this? And to be honest, like I'm not even sure, and mm. I I don't I don't care because you can't be normal and you can't enjoy yourself for as long as we have government hanging over our lives like that yeah. and people are suffering but at the end of this what i what i i honestly want to party yeah <laughs> oh, we gotta we're, make with it <laughs> we're with the right guys yeah. right now eh? <clears throat> <clears throat> okay cool well yeah. i mean then other than that <clears throat> then we have to ask the famous question yes sir we are the mbh podcast money buys happiness what are your thoughts on the term money buys happiness you know, first of all, we have to get away from thinking of this as a negative. Yeah. 
somehow we've been conditioned to believe that wanting to make money or to succeed is somehow contrary to being a good human being. I don't think that at all. It's the opposite. And especially as you know, many of us are immigrants here, we came here for a better life and that includes economic opportunity. So for someone to want to thrive and build a business and care for their loved ones, and we should not judge that. On the contrary, wanting to make money, wanting to succeed in business is a form of expression too. It's true. Yeah. Why should we be? So, so the answer to that question is, how do I feel about that? It's how, it's how an individual feels about that. If they're driven to succeed, and that includes to succeed financially, then I encourage that. And we should remember that small business and businesses and entrepreneurship is the backbone of our community. Yes. It's not government. <laughs> it's not government who's the provider. It's not public health. It's yeah. not. A <laughs> no, hell no. <laughs> it's, it's small businesses. And, yeah. and I, was, I was part of a small business. I was partner in a law firm for almost 10 years and we went from three employees to 28 30 employees probably at our height wow and that was such an it was such a wonderful thing because we've we've developed another type of family another type of community yeah we also paid a ton of tax yeah which is not such a bad thing it is business that pays for public health yeah it's business that pays the salaries of the talking heads that are ruining our lives right now. And we should not be shy about wanting to succeed and to make our communities better and to, to pay for those that require our help. To provide for your families. To provide for families and to give other people an opportunity. Yeah. And that's what you often do as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Your success pulls other people with you. So let it buy happiness. Yeah. Serge, <laughs> Serge, you got something different? <laughs> Money will always buy happiness as long as you don't throw your morals out the window. And that's it. It's yes. exactly what Roman said. Keep your head on straight and strive, strive to be the best for you and your community. Agreed. I love you, Sergio. <laughs> uh, Roman, last question. Oh, this one's personal. If, okay. if public health is harassing people, <laughs> what can they do about it? Because we have been harassed ourselves. <laughs> Are they allowed? Record them. Record them? Record yeah. them, put it online. Done. Yeah. They'll make a reel. You know, um, you, you told me this when, when I first walked yeah. in here that you had public. I, I hear from business owners all the time that public health came into their shop or public health is calling and they're making life so much harder for business owners. But it's not just that. It's the attitude and the culture and the approach that they do this with. Right, we had the stigma where if if someone gets sick with COVID or or someone has a COVID outbreak, God forbid, in a gym or in a restaurant, as if they're some sort of an evil doer, and that's nonsense. Yeah. It's a freaking virus. <laughs> it's transmissible. Yeah. It doesn't discriminate. And w w the fact that public health somehow changed the fact that we're living this framework where we're judging people or mistreating people. Um, has, is completely out of control and we need to remember and that goes to your previous question as well we need to remember who's the boss we are the boss we don't work for government we're not government subject people are not beholden to government government is accountable to the people and that includes public health public health is accountable to the people they're accountable for failing in leading in this pandemic. They're accountable for the misinformation that they've been spreading for almost two years. And they're accountable for the manner in which they treat people, loved ones who cannot visit their loved ones in a hospital or a long-term care home, children that, whose lives have been compromised because of bad public health policy, and small business owners who they're effectively terrorizing. We need a change in dynamic where government and public health remember again that we don't work for them they work for us i agree i think people have forgotten that they've forgotten that we the people are the power not the government not public health and we have surrendered that probably 
unwillingly or, or unknowingly over the last two years. But I think that that a lot of people need to come back to that and remember that it's our businesses that they're shutting down that pay their that that pay their salaries. That that it, it's us. We we are the backbone of of the society, and we can't be scared of these people. Anthony, you know how that begins. How that how you get that accountability? You fire them. Yeah. And when do you fire them? On election day. Yeah. Election day is June second. This is the first time I think that I'm urging that I'm urging people Everybody. to come out. Yeah. We need everyone to come out and make their voice count. Yeah. You got one vote. Yeah. We talk about democracy and rights. It's a inc- remarkable right to be willing to choose your government and to be willing to hold your government accountable for what for for their mismanagement and what they've done to so many lives. Vote them out. By voting them out, firing them on June second is the best thing you can do. Fire them all, all of them. I love it. Well, listen, we, we're gonna have to. Yeah, we have no choice. <laughs> Again, you guys are both busy guys. We appreciate you coming out today. Thank um, you. You know, appreciate Sergio making this happen. Don, YouTube, appreciate We've got you. Got a brother. whole fan behind behind the scenes right now. Roman, Chilling. thank you so much for coming. Yeah, the Roman, people have been be asking for you to come back. Yep. So we appreciate you coming and making the time. Appreciate all of your insight. Um, keep fighting the good fight yes boys. please we please keep it. fighting it uh we need guys like you to get us out of this mess um and and you know we we, we look to guys like you to do that so we appreciate you guys a, a lot of people look up to roman uh especially for speaking out last year and continuously speaking out till today and that's what we all need to do now yeah. more than ever speak yeah. out 100 be, be brave exactly and vote on election day june June 2nd 2nd, baby fire them all (laughs) so on that note dean we're out